God. We just ask you, God, move in a mighty way. Hallelujah, God. We thank you again. We welcome you to Household of Faith. Amen. Hallelujah. We welcome you to Household of Faith. We welcome in his presence to have this way on today. Amen. 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 Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. If you can just clap. Hallelujah. You are welcome, God, in this place, God, to just have your way, God. You are welcome, God. You are welcome, God. You are welcome, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. Hallelujah, God. We love you, and we adore you, God. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. You are welcome in this place, God, to do what you want to do, God. Hallelujah. You are welcome in this place, hallelujah, to do what you want to do, hallelujah, God, in us, God, and through us, God. Hallelujah, God. In us and through us, God. Hallelujah. We thank you for your presence that's here already residing, God, in this place, God. We thank you for your presence, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You are welcome in this place, God, to have your way. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. the Lord, everybody. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. 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 Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for allowing us to worship you. We worship you in spirit and in truth. Yes. Hallelujah. We worship you in that part of us that knows you are real. We worship you in the truth of what's going on in our lives. We worship you even when things don't look like what we think they should. We worship you because you are God. You are our promise. You are our exceedingly great reward. So if nothing else, we have you. If everybody needs, if everything else goes away, we have you. So we thank you for you. Yeah. And we pray that you have your way in this place that we set aside, that we've committed to give to you. Thank you that you will have your way in this place. We pray that you received our worship. And we pray that the word comes forth that it was fall on fertile ears. Because we know that faith without works is dead, but faith with works equals transformation. Yeah. So we thank you that we will be transformed as we act out and walk out the word that we receive today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Welcome to Household of Faith Church. Thank you. Amen. amen. And we want to welcome everybody who may watch this online. We welcome you to Household of Faith Church as well. And we don't only want to just welcome you uh, uh, from your home or wherever it is you're watching. We want to invite you to come out and worship with us. Amen. amen. All right, we're not going to prolong. Amen. We're going to get right into the word. Amen. As everybody knows, we've been in, I don't know if I'm going to call it a series, but this month we've decided to call this month Black History and Love Month, right? So I'm going to start today by giving you my topic. My topic today for today is the love that we don't like. The love that we don't like. And as I said, we've been in Black History and Love Month, and this is our third week. And just, I just thought, for anybody who will watch this online and on YouTube, and they wonder why we're celebrating Black History Month and Love Month, we want to give a brief explanation of that so they can understand. Because we just can't assume that everybody understands why we do things, right? So a brief explanation is this. February is recognized nationally and honored internationally as Black History Month. We know that. If you went to elementary school, you should know that, right? And, and during Black History Month, the achievements of African Americans and important events in the history of African Americans are honored and recognized. I think that history import is important. I shared that before. And I happen to be African American. <laughs> that goes without saying. But I, I do believe that history is important, and I believe that we can learn from history. So we should, we should, we should seek to find out what happened in the past and how we can not 
allow it to reoccur. So we can learn from history what to do and what not to do. And as it, as it comes to love, this past Friday, we celebrated, we celebrated Valentine's Day. And whether you celebrate it or not, um, the focus of Valentine's Day is supposed to be on love. And apart from the commercialization of it, I think that's a great thing. I think that any time we can celebrate love, we should. Amen? So, here at Household of Faith Church, we've combined the two, and thereby we have Black History and Love Month. Now, what I've been attempting to do with my messages, uh, and week one and week two, what I've been attempting to do is honor those who were and are, because, you know, we, we first covered Kobe, and then we covered last week, we used Megger Evers as an example. So I've been trying to use people who were and are influential African Americans and, and sharing their accomplishments, sharing their life practices, and sharing their messages of love. And then I've been highlighting them with the word of God. My hope and my prayer is that we are encouraged by the instruction of the word of God, but also along with their example, so that we can become living epistles of the word of God. That's what, the, that's what Paul says. Paul says that we're supposed to be living epistles of the word of God, being read by men, which means that, that people don't, aren't going to always read their Bible, but they will read you. They will see what you do. And if we say we are believers in God and, and believers in Jesus Christ, then we should be acting out the word that we say we believe so that when people see us, they will say, oh, okay, that's a Christian, that's a believer, that's a disciple of Jesus Christ, amen? amen. So we want to become epistles, we want to be living, breathing, walking examples of God's goodness, of God's glory, and of his grace, amen? amen. So one of the most recognized and prominent figures of the civil rights movement is Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., I did, a, I did an awesome report, I was share, share with Tina before, I did an awesome report on Dr. Martin Luther King when I was in elementary school. I had pictures of his grave because at the time my aunt was living in Atlanta, Georgia. I had pictures of his grave and I had pictures of his monument and all this other stuff. I did a crazy, it was awesome uh, report on Dr. Martin Luther King. And I got a good grade for it, but when, when, when the report got sent back home, all the pictures were missing. <laughs> the teacher had kept the pictures. My mom was upset about that. But, but, Bob, but Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Was a, was a great and prominent figure in the civil rights movement. And I think we all know or should know who Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is, amen? So I'm not going to go into too much detail of his life, but I'm going to share some things about him and then tie it into the message, amen? Yeah. So Dr. Martin Luther King, he was, he was a man of incre incredible achievement. He was the seminal leader of the civil rights movement. He was the co-founder of the, of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He was a key figure in the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. He was a key figure in the Montgomery boycott, Montgomery bus boycott. He was a key figure, and we should notice if you've seen the movie Selma, he was a key figure in the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965. He also was a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, Nobel Peace Prize in 1964 and beyond. All of this, I, I think he would say one of his greatest achievements was to be a husband and a father. Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, but I'm not going to focus on that. We want to focus on what he did and who he was. But after he was assassinated, he still got, got awards. After his death, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. After his death, he was honored with a national holiday. We know that we celebrate Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Day as a day of service. We try to do uh, works that honor him because he was a man of service. And we celebrate that day on the third Monday of January. 
And then Dr. Martin Luther King was honored with a monument of his, of his, of his stature, of his likeness in Washington, D.C. Now, Dr. Martin Luther King's message was a message of love. If you ever heard any of his speeches, any of his sermons, the focus was always on love. How I shared last week how love is one of the greatest powers. Well, he, he called love a weapon. And he, loved, he said love could overcome segregation, could overcome racism. So his focus was on love. We often are, uh, we're, we're familiar with Dr. King's um, speech uh, where he said uh, that a person should not be judged by their skin color but by the content of their character and all of that stuff. But he had another famous sermon as well. And that famous sermon was called Loving Your Enemies. That's the love that we don't like. Loving our enemies. But, but in this sermon, Dr. King said, we are to love our enemies because if you hate your enemies, you have no way to redeem or transform your enemies. But if you love your enemies, you will discover that at the very root of love is the power of redemption. You just keep loving people, and keep loving people, and you keep loving people. Even though they're mistreating you, you just keep loving them. Amen? Now, now we know it's one thing to talk about it. However, it's a whole different thing to walk it out. Dr. King actually lived out his words. Almost a year to the date of him preaching this message about loving your enemies, Dr. King had the opportunity to live it out. Dr. King was signing autographs of his autobiographical book in a department store. When a woman walked up to him and asked him if he was Martin Luther King Jr., and when he said he was, this woman stabbed him in his chest with a seven inch long steel letter opener. This woman walked up to him, I'm gonna say it again, asked him if he was Martin Luther King Jr. And when he said he was, she stabbed him in his chest with a seven inch steel letter opener. Dr. King was rushed to the hospital for emergency surgery, and during the x-rays for the surgery, it was revealed that the letter opener that was jammed into his chest was right on the edge of his aorta. That's the main artery. If, if that was punctured, he would have drowned in his own blood. It was so close to his artery that the doctor said if he would have sneezed, he would have died. Ten days later, Dr. King spoke from the hospital to let the world know that he had no ill will toward this lady that stabbed him. That's the power of God. He was, he was gracious enough to even wish this lady the best, and he hoped that she got the help that she desperately needed. As I said, for today, my topic is the love that we don't like. As my topic suggests, there is a love that we do like. What I mean by this is that there's an ideal expression of love that we have. We have an idea of what we think love should be. We have an ideal people that we think we should give that love to. When we think of love, we we resort to thinking of ourselves. We think about what we want. We think of comfort, we think of bliss, we think of ooey, gooey, warm feelings. If you look up the definition, even Webster says that love is an antique, an intense, deep feeling of affection, of affection. This is the ideal picture 
of love. The kind of love that we like. But I want you to know something. This is not love in itself. Amen? Love according to the Bible. Let's go there. God's definition of love is this. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 8. And I chose this version from the message Bible because it hits. This is what it says about love. It says love never gives up. Love cares more for others than it does for itself. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Doesn't have a swell head. Love doesn't force itself on others. Love isn't always me first. It says love doesn't fly you off the handle. It doesn't keep a score of the sins of others. Love doesn't revel when others grovel. That means it doesn't enjoy other people's difficulties. Love takes pleasure in the flowering of the truth. It says love puts up with anything. That's what love does. Love trusts God always. Love always looks for the best. Love never looks back. But love keeps going to the end. Love never dies. That's the Bible's definition and description of love. I don't know if when I read that, it hit you somewhere, but it hit me. Because we don't operate in that kind of love. But this is the kind of love that Dr. King talked about. This is the kind of love that Dr. King lived. If he wasn't led by love, he would have given up on the fight for civil rights. If he wasn't led by love, he would have forgave that woman that stabbed him. If he wasn't led by love, he could have gave up and said, here I am fighting for black people, and I get stabbed by a black person. I'm giving up. But he was led by love. Dr. King was led by love. If he wasn't led by love, he would have been more concerned about himself. The Bible said that love is not concerned about itself. But he was concerned, he was concerned about the rights of his people. If he wasn't led by love, he would have wished harm on his lady, but he wished that his lady got help. He, he didn't even wish that she, got, that she got punishment. He wished her the best. I'm talking about love. I don't know if you feel that, but that's different. Dr. King was before his time. Why do I say that? Because that was 50 years ago. He was operating this kind of love. And here we are in 2020, and we still can't operate that kind of love. We still can't forgive our enemy. We can't even give our brother or our sister. We still seek our own. He was before his time. This is not the kind of love that we like. But this is the kind of love that Jesus insists that we have. This message of loving your enemy that Dr. King preached did not originate with Dr. King. It didn't originate with him. As inspirational as Dr. King's words and actions were, his words and actions were not his. Amen? They were not his own. The words originated with Jesus. And you can only act out and operate in this kind of love when you've been transformed by the love of God. Amen? Amen. Before I go too deep, let me give you my scripture. Okay. Luke 6, 27 through 36. Luke 6, 27 through 36. This is Jesus speaking. He says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish others would do to you, do so 
to them. This kind of love that Jesus is talking about, it's not my idea of love. And it may not be your idea of love. This world that we live in does not condone this kind of love. But this is what Jesus says love is. And guess what? He's not done. He continues on. At verse 32, he says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. So you ain't doing nothing. But if you love your enemies and do good and lend and expecting to get nothing in return, your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Again, this is not my word. These are Jesus's. You want to argue with somebody, argue with him. I guarantee you won't win that argument. This love that Jesus is talking about is not the kind of love that we like. We don't mind loving those who love us. But Jesus says love your enemies. Your enemy. Your enemy is not somebody that you have that you had a disagreement with. That doesn't all matter if you make them your enemy. An enemy is not somebody that you had a, a small misunderstanding with. That's not really your enemy. Your enemy is not your husband or your wife after you had an argument. If it is, I'm praying for you. Your enemy may be, just thinking it may be an ex-husband, it may be an ex-wife, you understand that when I give you the definition. The, the, your enemy may be your baby mama or your baby daddy. You understand it again when I give you the definition. But your enemy is someone who is actively opposed to you. Oh, yeah. Your enemy is someone who is hostile yeah. to you. Yeah. Your enemy is somebody who hates you. Hate. Hate is a strong word. Hate is not just dislike. But hate, hate is passionate distaste. When somebody hates you, they abhor you. That means they feel it in their bones, their hate for you. They feel it in their bones, their aversion to you. These people, Jesus says, love. Come on, Lord. See, see we don't mind blessing those who bless us. To bless means to speak well of. It means to do good toward. It means to make them or wish them happiness. But Jesus says, bless those who curse you. Do you know what curse means? Curse means the exact opposite of bless. Curse means to express anger towards somebody. Curse means to, 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 to express annoyance towards somebody. Curse means to address with offensive Words. Even more than that, curse means to wish harm on somebody. To curse somebody means to use words uttered in the intention to invoke a supernatural power to inflict them. Jesus says, speak well of those who express anger toward you. Jesus says, bless those who, who are angry and annoyed at you. He says, do good to those who wish harm upon you. We don't like that. Jesus says, pray for those who abuse you. So I'm supposed to talk to my God and ask him to touch those who are uttering words against me 
to a supernatural power, their God, whoever it may be, but it ain't my God if you hate somebody. I'm supposed to talk to God, my God, about this person who is speaking words with the intention to invoke a supernatural power to harm me. Jesus said, pray for them. Not only that, I'm supposed to, to pray for those that abuse me, that, that treat me badly, that misuse me. I'm supposed to pray for them. Jesus says, yep. He's supposed to do it. He goes further. He says, and to the one who slapped you in the face, turn to the other side. God got to help me if that happens. That's hard. But he said you got to do it. He says, to the one who takes your coat, give him your shirt too. I'm bringing it to him into our words so we can understand it. That's what he meant when he said, when he takes your, your coat, give him your tunic. What he's saying is, if he takes your coat, give him your shirt. He says, if someone keeps asking you for something, stop saying you don't have it, give it to him. If someone takes what is yours, don't ask for it back. And then he said, what you want people to do for you, do it for them. Before somebody does it for you. That's what Jesus says love is. We don't like that kind of love. I'm being honest with you. I don't like this kind of love. It's not our idea. It doesn't fit our description or our mindset. But Jesus says this is what love is. Jesus insists that our love be expressed this way because there's supposed to be a difference between us who say we know God and those who don't. There's supposed to be a difference. He says, the sinner who does not know God loves those who love him. It's, it's even a shame. It's no different. He says, the sinner who does not know God does good to those who does good for them. It's not hard for them. He says, the sinner who does not know God lends to those who he knows is going to give him back what he gave them. It's no loss for him. He said, but if, but if you do as they do, there's no difference between you and them. But there's supposed to be a difference. But we want to rationalize this thing. I know it's difficult, but we're supposed to ask God to help us. Why? Because we don't just say we love God. We show we love God. The Bible says that we are those who love in word and deed. Amen? We know the word of God is powerful. Amen? But the power is released when you do it. Not just when you read it. Amen? Don't misunderstand me. It's a great thing to read the word of God. Why? Because when we read it, we're getting information about God. Amen? But after we read it, and after we glean, glean information about God, we're supposed to apply it. What we read. We're supposed to put in action what we read. And when we do that, we experience transformation. The power of the word of God. The change that God wants to bring about in our lives and those around us. Why? Because faith plus works equals transformation. But faith without works is dead. It goes nowhere. So, so our faith has to have action with it for it to work. I can say that I'm believing God all day. But if my belief is not paired with action, ain't nothing going to change. Not one single thing. But guess what? In addition to action, my faith needs love. Galatians 5 and 6 says, faith works by love. Which means in order for my faith to work, I have to add to it action. But my actions have to be motivated by love. Have to be motivated by love. God's love for me, I got to understand that to really walk in faith. And then 
my love for myself. Why? I explained that to you, but I talked about it last week. We love, when you realize who God is and that you've been made in His image and likeness, you love yourself. And then when you totally understand that, you have the love for God and love for yourself, you don't mind loving other people. The more we understand God's love for us, the more we love Him. The more we love Him, the more we trust Him. The more we trust Him, the more our faith grows. As my love goes for God, my love goes for myself. As my love goes for myself, so does my love for other people. It's a chain reaction. It all works together. I see myself as being made in the image and likeness of God. And I see other people that way, even if they don't see themselves that way. This is what Jesus meant. I shared it last week. This is what he meant when he said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and love your neighbor like you love yourself. This love is produced in us by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Romans 5 and 5 says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given us. So, so the difference between us who say we know God and those who don't is what? Love. God's love. That's the difference. See, see, see we're not required to love like this on our own. You can't do it. It's not natural for man to love their enemies. The natural response is to protect yourself when somebody hurts you. To shield yourself when somebody hurts you. But, but God's love enables you to love your enemies. It's God's love that enables you to do good when somebody done wrong to you. It is God's love that allows you to link to somebody that you know ain't got no intentions on giving it back to you. Not even when they say they get their tax, they're going to give it to you. God's love will allow you to give it to them and know that you're not giving it back. Amen? Yeah. Jesus says this. He says, if you do this, all this stuff that I'm telling you, your reward will be great. And you will be the sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Jesus says, if you love the way I'm telling you to love, if you do what I'm telling you to do, if you love the way that you don't like, I'm going to reward you. I'm going to reward you, not, not just reward you, but I'm going to reward you greatly. Do you know what a reward is? Yes. A reward is something that's given to you in recognition of your effort. Another word for reward is bounty. A bounty is given liberally, generously. Jesus says, I'm going to reward you. This is why you and I, when we do what Jesus said do, we don't have to expect it from them. Because he's going to reward us generously, liberously, greatly. Amen? We don't have to expect it from them. You don't have to expect love back from your enemy. You don't have to try to get back what they took from you. Because Jesus is going to give it back to you. The Bible says that every man will get a reward. Every man. For the deeds done in his body. If you did good, your reward is going to be good. If you did evil, guess what? Your reward is going to match that. You will be rewarded. God will reward those who do what he say and God will reward those who do you dirty. They will get their just reward. So you just do what Jesus says. Jesus says if you do this, if you love the way that you don't want to love you will be like the most high. He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Well, 
I'm gonna ask you a question. Who are the who are the ungrateful and who are the evil? The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 12, he says, All who are unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. He said, Among them are the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality. It's the word of God. Thieves, great thieves, greedy people, drunkards, revilers that are people who verbally attack people, swindlers, deceptive, manipulative people. He says, these will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says this at verse 11. He says, and such were some of you. You, you were ungrateful. You were evil. I was ungrateful. I was evil. God was kind and gracious and merciful to us. <coughs> but Paul says, Paul says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So, when I love my enemy, I'm acting as God acted toward me. When I love my enemy, I'm acting like my father. I was once an enemy of God. You were once an enemy of God. But he cleaned us. He washed us by his spirit. He loved us. He loved those who were his enemy and he calls us to do the same. Your efforts of acting to others like you were acting toward by God, Jesus says will be rewarded greatly. He says, he says, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may be able to abound in every good work. I will give you the grace to love your enemies. So, so, so if, so if you give love, guess what? God's going to lavish love on you Lavish love on you. If, if you give encouragement, he's going to encourage you extravagantly. He will reward you. He said, if, if you're, he said, be merciful like I am merciful. So if you show mercy, guess what? God going to give you mercy. That's what our God says. Jesus said, if you do like I say, you're going to be like God. I know people don't like when church people talk about material blessings. But all of us want clothes and cars and roofs over our heads. Even people who say churches shouldn't talk about that one of those things. Am I lying? But this is what Jesus says. He told me to give my enemy money if they ask for it. He told me to give them my clothes if they ask for it. He said for them, for me to give them my goods if they ask for it. And he will reward me. So in whatever area I'm attempting to act like God, I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be expecting an ROI, a reward on my investment. So if I'm giving money, yes, he's going to bless me with money. If I'm giving my clothes, he's going to bless me with clothes. If I'm giving my goods, he's going to bless me with that. He's going to reward me with it. Amen? I referenced Dr. King's sermon when I began loving your enemies. And in this sermon, he gave four practical ways that he practiced loving his enemies. I'm going to share those along with what the Word said because I think if it helped him, it can help us. Amen? Amen. Why? Because our faith has to be acted out. Amen? Amen. So, so Dr. King said, he said, looking at himself helped him to love his enemy. He said, in looking at oneself, we must face the fact that an individual might dislike us because of something that we've done. We don't like that. We don't like to look at ourselves. We think we're perfect. One thing we have a hard time doing is being honest. Being honest about our mistakes. Being honest about our hiccups being honest about our shortcomings. We don't mind telling people when they're wrong. But when it comes to us, 
Yes. You can hear a pin drop. That's right. Amen. We have to admit when we're wrong. Yes, and we have to apologize when we're wrong. And if it's possible, try to make it right. We have to ask ourselves sometimes, did I make this person my enemy? That's what we got to ask ourselves sometimes. Because sometimes people don't just like you for nothing. This time I'm going to do yeah. But you gotta look at yourself and say, did I do something? Because you know why? You heard just you heard somebody before. Amen. Dr. King said that we have to discern between love and like. This helped him love his enemy. He said, like, like is sentimental. Like is affectionate. Like, I like pizza, I like this, I like that. You have a love for it. But love is different. Love is understanding. You can love somebody and not necessarily like them. There's a lot of difficult people, Dr. King said, there's a lot of people that he, he found difficult to love. I'm, not, I'm saying that again. He said there's a lot of people that he found difficult to like. But love was different. Love caused him to look at them through the eyes of himself and say, what caused him to be that way? What caused him to act like that? Love caused him to seek to understand them. So he, he, he came to the conclusion that I ain't necessarily, necessarily got to like them, but I have to love them. Oftentimes, we fail at discerning the difference between love and like. Like feels good. Like is easy. Like is the things that I like to do. But love is doing when I don't like doing it. That's the difference. I don't, I don't necessarily like going to work. But I, but, I, but, I, but I don't necessarily love going to work rather. But I like having money. I don't necessarily like going to the gym every day. But I, but I like not going to the hospital and being sick. Yeah. Yeah, benefits. I, I, I don't necessarily love putting, putting, I don't necessarily like putting gas in Tina's car every time I get in it. <laughs> but, I, but I love her and I don't want her to get stranded somewhere. <laughs> See, there's a difference between love and like. It's easy to do the things that you like, but love will push you to do the things that you don't want to do. I may not necessarily like a person's demeanor or attitude, but, but we all come from somewhere. I don't know what a person may have endured that made them that way. But understanding that helps me to love them. That's right. Be patient. Again, someone may feel the same way about me. Love and understanding. Dr. King said, we should help those we hate. Sounds crazy, but hear it out. He said, he said helping those he hated helped him to, helped him to love them. He said, when the opportunity presents itself for you to defeat your enemy, that is when you must not do it. We all have an opportunity to step on somebody who hurts us next. If you take the opportunity, it doesn't make you strong. To kick somebody when they're down, it makes you weak. He said, when you rise to the level of love, it's great beauty and power you will only seek to defeat the evil systems behind that person, not that person. We have to remember, and the Bible says it, and we, I think we quote it a lot of times, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But do we really realize that? There's a spirit behind that person, a spirit behind those actions, but you focus, we focus on the person. We have to remember we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against spirits. But 
against evil influences, against strongholds that people have in their mind. Strongholds are ways of thinking. We see the person, but we have to look at what is behind the person, what is using the person. The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not earthly, they're not fleshly. But they are mighty through God. Love is something we don't want to do to our enemy. But the Bible says when we do it, we don't know what God may cause to happen out of it. You may even win over your enemy. Amen? I shared from Romans 12, 20 a couple of times. And, and Romans 12, 20 says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. And the Bible says if you do this, you will heap burning coals on his, on his head. Our thought is, is, why would I give my enemy something to eat? Why would I give my enemy something to drink? But God is saying, you don't know what I will bring out of that if you just do it. I talked about it before, and I'm just talking to touch, on, touch on a little bit. When Paul wrote Romans 12 and 20, he was actually quoting Proverbs 25 and 22. When this proverb was written, people heated their homes and cooked with fire. But sometimes a person's fire would go out through the night. And they would be cold. And they would not be able to cook breakfast. So as a result, they would have to go to their neighbor's house and, and borrow some coal so that they could restart their fire. But imagine if your neighbor was your enemy. Paul says we're supposed to give our enemy not just one coal, but a whole bunch of coal, heaping coal. This makes sense when you think about it. During this time, people used to carry things on their head. If you gave your enemies heaping coal to carry back to their home, they would have to carry it on their head. And on his way home, he's thinking about you. all the wrong he's done to you, how he's hurt you, how he's mistreated you, and yet you gave him coal when you didn't have to. This is what it means by you heaping, heaping, burning coals on his head. He is, he is feeling guilty yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. because of the love you showed him when you didn't have to. There you, go. you could have kicked him when he was down. You could have let him in his house over freeze. But you gave him coals. He, this, this person could never speak ill of you again. This person could never mistreat you again. That's what Paul means by heaping burning coals on his head. If I take you in, but I can easily take you out, you can never say anything bad about me again. This is what Paul means by heaping burning coals on your enemy's head. And this is what you're doing when you love your enemy, those who are against you, when you do well with them, when, they, when their intention was wrong toward you, you're heaping burning coals on your head. The last thing that Dr. Said, Dr. King said that helped him to love his enemy was seeing the good. Seeing the good helped him love his enemy. He said, he said seeing the good in all helped him to love his enemy because within the best of us there is some evil. And in the worst of us, there is some good. He said, discover the element of good in your enemy. And as you seek to hate him, find the center of goodness and place your attention there. And you will take a new attitude. Amen. This kind of goes to the first step. Even though you think you're perfect, you're not. I'm not perfect. And someone may consider you their enemy. We don't often think about the people that we hurt. We always think about who hurt us. But there's somebody that you hurt. That's right. And guess what? You don't even know it. And, 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 and as good as you think you are, 
there is something wrong in you somewhere. And as bad as you think somebody else is, there's something good in them somewhere. What it comes down to is consideration. Just consider what a person has come from, what a person has gone through, what a person has endured. Just like you want somebody to be considered of you. I'm going to close by saying I'm not going to dare to say that loving our enemies is easy. Jesus never says it's easy. But he says we got to do it. Which means it's possible. And, and remember, we don't have to do it in and of our strength. It's going to take his strength to do it. We got, we got to walk this thing out by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight, but guess what else? Not by feelings either. And faith doesn't make things easy. It makes things possible. Amen? Jesus says, when you do this, you're acting like God. When you love your enemies, remember, you're acting to other people just like God acted toward you. Toward you. There you go. Big up. Amen. This is the love that we don't like. But this is the love that we gotta walk in. We we don't walk by how we feel, we don't walk by what we like. We walk by what God says. Yeah. Amen. We are those who love in word and deed. The Bible says you can't say you love God and not love those you see. You can't say you love God. You ain't never seen it. But you see your brother and your sister. Every day. You got to love them before you love God. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for your word and help us to live it out. We ask in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for all of those who are watching and all of us here. Help us to live out this word. Help us to live it out. The transformation comes through acting it out. Not just talking about it and not just reading it, but it comes through living it. Help us to live it out in Jesus' name. We ask you to touch our minds, touch our hearts. Give us, heal us where we're hurting. Heal us where we need it, Lord. Heal our bodies, heal our minds, heal our, heal our spirits. Give us strength where we're weak. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We thank everybody who tuned in. And if you would love, you want to come visit us, amen. You want to come visit us, we're at 219 North Market Street in Wilmington, Delaware, amen. If, if you've been touched by this word and you would like to sow into this ministry, if you have the cash app, uh, app on your phone, you can sow it to us through dollar sign HHF. H H H O F D E, right? Dollar sign H H O F C D E. Household of Faith Church Delaware. Dollar sign H H O F C D E. And you're welcome to come fellowship with us anytime you want. Amen. Amen. God bless and have a blessed day.